Our Earth has existed for 45 million centuries. But this one is special. It's the first where in one species, ours has the planet's future in its hands. Over nearly all of Earth's history, threats have come from nature. Disease, earthquakes, asteroids, and so forth. But from now on, the worst dangers come from us. And it's now not just the nuclear threat. In our interconnected world, network breakdowns can cascade globally. Air travel can spread pandemics worldwide within days. And social media can spread panic and rumor literally at the speed of light. We fret too much about minor hazards. Improbable air crashes, carcinogens in food, low radiation doses and so forth. But we and our political masters are in denial about catastrophic scenarios. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome everybody out there in the wide world of astrophysics, cosmology, philosophy, and really an understanding, anyone who has an understanding uh, and a desire to know more about our natural world and the place that science holds within it, you're in for a treat talking to a great friend, not only of uh, UCSD, science, uh, and, and other uh, phenomena, but really a hero of mine and many of the really the most uh, proficient, I would say, uh, working theorists and 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 cosmology uh, really look to Martin, uh, Lord Martin Rees, today's guest, uh, for inspiration and for really a voice of reason in uh, you know continually troubled age. So, Lord Martin, thank you so much for joining us from the UK. How are you today, sir? I'm fine. It's great to be in touch with you again. It is, and I love all of your books. I've read all of your books. You you blurbed one of my books, and we'll get to that later because today is Nobel Prize Day. Uh, we kicks off. It's I call it Christmas for nerds. Um, and we both have perspectives on, including in this book, and, and we'll get to the contents of this book and we'll talk about many other things all, all along the way. And we'll probably run out of time before we run out of topics as we often do. Um, it's just, it's just such an honor, Martin, uh, to speak with you, but uh, I want to do what I'm uh, told that you should never do, which is to judge a book by its cover. You're just not supposed to do that. That's considered poor form, but I always say, what else do you have to go on, uh, besides the cover and the title? Uh, and so I always ask my authors who honor me by coming on the podcast, I ask them, as I ask you now, what was the genesis, the origin story behind this magnificently illustrated cover, but more importantly, behind the title that you chose uh, for this wonderful new book? So Martin, if you could indulge us in what I call judging books by their covers. Well, I... I'm going to escape my answer by saying that both of them were chosen by my editor. <laughs> That's about 80% of the time I hear that answer. Right, yes. And, uh, I, I was uh, not so sure about the title, um, but I think a plain cover is okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm not unhappy with it. <laughs> um, when I uh, read the, the title, so the title, If Science Is to Save Us, there's a lot loaded into that uh, title. So can you can you walk us through the meaning of the title? Um Yes, well, the, my theme really is that uh, our everyday world has only come about because of the science of the last century or two, um, but science is now uh, more empowering and that has both good and bad possibilities. So uh, the stakes are very high and what we could do, obviously, is to uh, harness science and provide a better life for everyone in the world than we in the West have at the moment. On the other hand, uh, there are disasters uh, which can be triggered by the misapplication of science. So the stakes are getting higher. This is a theme I've uh, talked about in the past, but I feel more and more concerned. But in this book, I discuss not only those concerns, but uh, the scientific community, how it reacts to uh, uh, threats, um, how it interacts among itself, and the interaction between science and politics and the wider public. All of those are important topics. And I've had experience in my later years of being involved in scientific organizations and also in a bit of politics. So the book is really a mixture of uh, uh, science and how it's applied and its social consequences. So when I first received the book, <clears throat> uh, I couldn't help but thinking, you know, Lord Martin is a member of the House of Lords. 
and this common refrain that I've never really un quite understood. Maybe you can walk me through it. Um, God save the queen. Uh, and and uh, I, I couldn't help but be reminded of that phrase. It came into my mind. And this is in early mid-August when I received the book. And of course, we're talking in early October. Yes. The queen, sadly, is no longer with us. I wondered if you could explain or just what was your relation? You, you once joked with me and I I, I, I steal this joke, but I, I usually give you attribute. I always give you attribution because it can't apply to anybody else. But you once told me as a joke that your job as astronomer royal was to tell the queen her horoscope. Uh, but <laughs> so I can't I can't say I've ever done that. So I always give you attribution as a good academic should. But Martin, what was she like? Um, to what extent did you know her? Did you get to know the personal side of her? And what does her passing mean, not only for the Great Britain, but what does it mean, if anything, to science itself? Yes. Well, let me say, I, I didn't know her personally, but I met her on a number of occasions. Um, once or twice through being astronomer royal, but more often because I was a member of some elite body called the Order of Merit, which uh, had regular lunches. And uh, when I was president of the Royal Society, we celebrated our 350th anniversary. And it was quite a big jamboree where we had seven, me seven members of the royal family there, etc. So I had some contact, but uh, normally in a sort of official context. So I wouldn't claim to have known her. But I think if you ask what her impact was, uh, the fact that most people can't remember a time when she wasn't around as queen indicates that she's been a stable aspect of life in this country despite all the changes and so it is really the end of an era and of course uh, uh, since she started as queen very young and served for 70 years it's unlikely that we'll ever uh, in the next 200 years even if monarchy continues have uh, someone serving for so long um, but uh, it was a very special reign that she uh, and she managed to keep the respect of everyone for all that period. Yeah. Yeah. I just think of her with such great dignity. My mother met her uh, back in uh, sometime in the 60s for, you know, 10 seconds, but it had this lifelong effect on her. Um, and uh, and I wonder, you know, if if I could pivot extremely quickly uh, just to a notion that I've had recently, which is the state of uh, which r runs throughout this wonderful book, the state of uh, science in the United Kingdom, uh, both on the synoptic, you know, grand overview, but but also down in the in the in the weeds a little bit. Uh, as you know, the Great British pound has has fallen precipitously. There's a new prime minister, as I understand it. I, I don't know how all these things work. Uh, it's very shadowy to us in the United States. We just have simple things like an electoral college that's representative based on gerrymandering. That Anyway, I don't want to get into U.S. politics. Um, but um, but we there's been a lot of turmoil economically. There's been Brexit. There's been um, uh, the new prime minister, the, the overthrow of the previous prime minister, you know, his, his formed government is dissolved. Uh, and now your new prime minister. Um, I've been thinking venally <laughs> that now might be a great time for U.S. institutions to kind of scoop up the best of British talent uh, uh, in that we can offer maybe, you know, a slightly better you know, caliber of 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 monetary you know performance for you know, things like houses and mortgages that are very important to academicians. You talk about salary and funding scientists in this book. Mm -hmm. um, am I wrong? Uh, you know, is it is it should I be ashamed of these thoughts, Martin, that I that I am thinking about? Who could we poach from the United Kingdom right now, including you, maybe, uh, to come to a U.S. institution, uh, po possibly to to LinkedIn or extend their right. careers or make them more enjoyable and to bolster the scientific reputation of the U.S.? Is this shameful behavior by me? Well, you're being very patriotic, but let me just say <laughs> um, why I don't resonate. Let me f first make clear, I think the present government is an embarrassing disaster. <laughs> Okay. I don't support the Conservative Party, but this lot um, are heading off in the wrong direction. Um, but the reason I don't resonate with your view is that um, I feel that their problem is they are trying to ape the US too much. Mm. And it's far better to learn more from Scandinavia, which has high tax, strong welfare state, etc. And they're moving away from that. They admire what you're doing here. Um, despite the fact that you have the worst prison system in the Western world and the amazing gun prevalence, etc. Um, and they would do far better if they were to uh, uh, learn from the countries of Northern Europe, in particular, to have good welfare states and, according to most uh, uh, polls, the happiest people. Mm -hmm. So they're heading in the wrong direction. But I think <laughs> America has led them in the wrong direction, in my view. 
<laughs> well, I have to take. Well, I've never, I, I've never felt tempted. In fact, uh, uh, when I was um, thirty, I got a top professorship at Cambridge, and I then got offers from two or three American universities, um, which I declined, of course. Um, but I never got any offers since then. Hmm. It could be I thought my work declined after the age of 30, but I think more likely they realized that I was not likely to want to defect to the US. Right. And right. having said that, though, um, I would like to acknowledge all that I've benefited from by short visits to the US, the main centers. And of course, I've gotten many friends at uh, La Jolla, and I've written papers with seven of the faculty at Santa Cruz yes. and also with many in other places like uh, like Princeton and uh, and Harvard. Absolutely, yeah. I had many, many academic connections. But in terms of living there um, uh, outside academia, I've never been tempted at all. Well, uh, I just uh, I want to be respectful, but I have to say one of the issues, and this is getting deep into the weeds for my U.S. Uh, uh, listeners, but but for my U.K., I have a sizable audience in the U.K. I love the audience. Yeah. I'm going to visit them and maybe do an event there next year in 2023. Uh, but uh, one of the uh, one of the organizations you criticize in this uh, wonderful book is, I, I think, the UKRI, which, uh, again, you, you kind of um, say is aping too much of the U.S. kind of mandate. But I want to be extremely uh, show my extreme gratitude to UKRI because they have just funded the United Kingdom participation in the Simons Observatory to the tune of many, many, you know, tens of millions of pounds or dollars, I guess we'll say here. And, and that's to enable transformative science in the very field that you helped to kick off, which is the uh, science of CMB polarization. So, so Martin, don't be too hard on UKRI, okay? They're, they're paying, you know. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good. And of course, we have good scientists in this field. Um, and, and I think, it's very important also to realize that uh, uh, despite Brexit, which was a disaster for the UK mm. in general, um, we remain in the great European consortia, the European Southern Observatory, which is building the world's largest telescope, 39 meters diameter, um, and uh, the European Space Agency, which has had the exciting projects like uh, the Planck spacecraft, which you obviously know about. Absolutely. And so Fortunately, despite Brexit, we remain in those consortia. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so let's go back to the book, uh, Lord Martin. The book um, is a exposition of the state of science and the limitations of science. First, I want to start with the, I want to go through it almost Talmudically, as I want to do on, on, on occasion. So science, the word science comes from, as I understand it, the Latin scientia which means knowledge. It does not mean wisdom, which is sapienza, uh, which is uh, why we're called homo sapiens. And as I understand it, I may be wrong, but the thing that we have wisdom about sapiens of is that we're going to die. We're the only creatures that are aware that life is finite. Uh, as smart as my, you know, pet, uh, pet, you know, pit bull is, uh, she doesn't know that she's going to die. And I, I wonder um, if we sometimes conflate the two, uh, wisdom, uh, sapience, and knowledge, science. Um, and, and in this notion of saving and kind of almost messianic, if that's really the appropriate realm for scientists to be expected to achieve, what, what do you think, Martin? Um, do we put too much of a burden on that word science and scientists? Well, uh, no, I think science itself, as you say, is ethically neutral. Um, but the point is that uh, it can be applied uh, for benefit or in a damaging way. And the ethical choices will determine whether science does save us or destroy us. That's the whole point of the title. Right. So when science is sometimes, though, conflated with scientists, uh, and you make a clear distinction in this book um, of the limitations of that, I, I guess I wonder what drew you to science what what is um i, I interviewed your, your countryman uh jim al khalili not too long ago on the publication of this wonderful yeah. book the joy of science um uh, we get a lot of pleasure out of science uh, most of us would do this job if we didn't get paid for it um uh, don't tell my governor gavin newsom he's my boss and and he will take advantage of you saying that um but what is it that attracts you to science and and what is it that scientists really need i mean we get to you know, we get paid not not incredibly well by, you know, Wall Street standard, but we get paid a handsome salary. Even I at a public university in the south of California, um, you know, uh, I'm very comfortable. But um, and we get academic freedom, we get tenure and we get 
basically similar things that were present a thousand years ago when the University of Bologna was started in the year 1080. Um, what do what does society owe scientists? Let me let me ask that question. If 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 us if we are to save scientists, is there an obligation of a society to quote unquote save scientists? Um, well, I think if we look back over the last hundred years, uh, we will see that most of the uh, benefits of everyday life. Um, in health, communications, transport, and all the rest, uh, can be traced back to um, often sort of um, uh, undirected science. Um, and uh, it's often said that sciences of two kinds, applied and not yet applied. <laughs> and so uh, I think everyone can look back and say that the investment made in science and supporting scientists has uh, uh, certainly proved itself a good investment over the last uh, century or not. Of course, it's not so true if you go back further, because um, before the mid-19th century, um, technology was um, quite separate. I mean, they could build marvellous cathedrals and steam engines, etc., but that came before any uh, real science. So it's only since the mid-19th century that we've had this symbiosis between uh, academic science and its applications. Uh, but I think we can say that it has um, uh, proved its worth um, and, of course, um, the same people in the universities who do the science, certainly in the uh, system we have in your country and mine, uh, they are the people who also do the teaching. And so an output of our life's work is not just the research we do, uh, but the uh, students who we hope to uh, educate so that they can take part not just in science, but in uh, other walks of life where the background is crucial. And of course, one of the themes of my book later on is that everyone needs to have some feel for science because so much of the world depends on it and so many decisions that we have to take as citizens, whether they be on health, uh, energy or the environment, have a scientific dimension. Uh, so science is something which uh, needs to percolate to the wide public and we need to have the experts to do that as well as to extend the research. And you've been you know, kind of a mentor, as I say, a hero, however you want to phrase it to, to me and many millions of people around the world. Um, and part of that's because of your, you know, really just tireless pursuit of science outreach and an explication, uh, which comes not only at the by way of your extreme, you know, eloquent and uh, and, and wonderful, you know, capability to deliver the message, but also because you have authenticity because of your great scientific accomplishments. In America, well, I shouldn't say in America, there are people in other countries as well, but it's almost denigrated to some extent. I had, um, I have all these finger puppets here. Uh, Lord Martin, indulge me with some forbearance while I try to find some of them. Uh, I'm looking for Carl Sagan. I've got him somewhere in here. Um, I'll, I'll put, I'll put up uh, a Galileo just to to make uh, the video watchers happy. Um, so you know, of course, he was sort of seemed like he was almost punished in some ways. He was a great scientist. Uh, and also he was a great communicator. And at some, by some reckonings, he received more attention as a scientist by virtue of the Cosmos series in 1980 uh, than any other scientist before or since, because now everything's so fractured. There's 10 million cat videos uploaded to YouTube every second, I'm told. Uh, but now, you know, but back then it was three channels here. And I remember watching it as a kid. Um, by what, you know, kind of you know, tech tools or by, by what mechanism could we perhaps make it so that scientists are not penalized or, or looked down upon uh, for, for participating in the public dialogue, which I think we have a moral obligation to do since we're getting paid by the public. We have to communicate to them. I mean, imagine you went to tell your dean, you know, you can't understand what I'm, well, you could get away with it. I couldn't get away with it. <laughs> you don't, you don't know what I'm doing or you work at Apple and you tell Tim Cook, uh, you can't understand what I'm doing. It, it's beyond you. You know, as Feynman said, uh, yeah, if it was worth a Nobel, if, if I could explain it to you, it wouldn't have been worth a Nobel prize. <laughs> um, but so Lord Martin, can you tell us what, you know, first of all, did you consciously set about in any way to study the craft of communication, marketing, you know, in some way to that that you know could teach the the true wonderful script, the greatest story ever written in some ways? Uh, did you ever study the the mode by which you could mm. communicate it, or are you just preternaturally gifted at that? Well, I, I'd like to go back and query what you were saying. I mean, uh, I think it, it is true, and maybe true in America, uh, that uh, 
uh, popularization was frowned on. Um, and I think it's disgraceful the way the American National Academy was so late in giving recognition to Carl Sagan, right. of whom I was an immense fan. I thought it was wonderful. Yeah. Um, and, and we need more people like that. And I, I think I say in my book that uh, uh, we, we need people like him to um, uh, uh, lead campaigns. I found him. I'm uh, sorry. I, I found him, Laura Martin. Yep. And, uh, yep. <laughs> I had his he widow, was, was Adrian, has been has been a guest on the podcast, and his daughter Sasha Sagan has been a guest oh, on yes. the podcast. It's yes. it's a family affair. Yes. So, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, and of course, Neil Parsons done the sort of uh, updated version. Yeah, um, but uh, I, I think he was a great guy. Um, but if if I think back to myself, I mean, I um, uh, was brought up in the university where um, many of the greatest figures had been popularizers especially in my subject. I mean, right, Fred right. Hoyle um, the, wrote science fiction, and uh, he was, in my view, for 25 years, the world's number one astrophysicist in terms of range of ideas. Um, he went um, a bit sort of eccentric in his later years, but he was a really great man. And thinking back um, to earlier generations, another of my direct predecessors was Arthur Eddington, mm. who was famous for his for his books and so uh and uh, i think in other fields people like jbs holdane mm -hmm. uh, bernal and other people of that kind um got through to the wider public so i think there was always a intermeshing of uh, wider culture with science in britain and i don't think it harms people's reputation at all mm -hmm. so i'm sorry if that's the case in the u.s yeah no there are you know there are kind of yeah it's, it's almost like well if you are if you have time uh, and, and you're a scientist, you know, maybe you'll, maybe you'll teach and maybe you'll put some energy into learning how to be a good teacher and the, you know, modes of pedagogy, but, you know, really we pay you to, to do research and to get grants and so forth. And maybe we could pivot there to, you know, academia, as, as I mentioned, yeah, you have a lot of, uh, of opinions about academia and how to improve it both in the UK and, and elsewhere. Um, yeah. and the models thereof. And and you kind of reminded me of something uh, maybe I knew, but I, I didn't really remember. And it's that really in other countries like Germany uh, and some places in Asia and France, they have dedicated research institutes where the um, scientists work like Max Planck or CRNRS in France, but only in, in the, uh, you know, in the kind of other Western countries, maybe Italy and, and then the UK and England and, and America, which all trace back to to Germany by, uh, ironically, uh, the Humboldt, uh, institutes and so forth, but, but how, how it's possible, like, I don't expect my airline pilot, you know, because he's really good at, uh, or she's really good at flying you know, to be like an expert meteorologist. Okay. There's something to do with meteorology and flying, but you know, and I'm a, I fly little tiny planes, but, but I'm, I'm not a meteorologist. If I did, if I were a meteorologist, San Diego is the ideal place to do it, Martin, because, you know, we basically have one weather icon that we have to put up every day, as you know, um, not so for our sports teams, we, we, we don't have such good consistency, but why do we, why do we come to expect that, you know, because you're a good researcher, you'd be a good teacher. I mean, it happens to be true for people like Faraday and and others. But you know, I don't I don't know that Dirac was a great teacher, right? So, um, can you? Talk I went about... to lecture. He wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, you know, Feynman was an amazing lecturer. At least if you were, you know, at a at a Nobel level caliber to understand half of the stuff. Not a freshman. But um, why do we do that? Why do we assume that just because someone's brilliant at at research that they'll make good teachers? And then give them no training on how to be a teacher. I mean, I've, I've received no training on pedagogy and maybe that's my fault, but why do we assume that, you know, because you're brilliant in the lab or in the, uh, in the, in the computer or the theory uh, space that you'll be good at teaching? Yes. Um, well, it's true that there's not a good correlation, particularly between being a good researcher and a good teacher, but nonetheless, um, I think there is a virtue in the research universities, as you say, the, the Germans have abandoned it, but we have it in uh, the UK and the US, and it's that the Chinese have adopted it to some yes. extent. Singapore, um, and yeah. uh, it, 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 I think um, it, it does have, I would say, two virtues. First, it does mean that um, the best students get exposed, even at the undergraduate level, um, to the best researchers. Um, and that may be may be important in stimulating them at the frontier, as it were. Um, but I think it also really uh, has the effect of uh, ensuring that the teachers, the academics, slightly broaden their perspective. And I think there is a risk of uh, excessive narrowness in academia. And if they have to teach or 
talk to a public audience is broader. Um, uh, in fact, I, I quote in my book the, um, uh, the story of Penzias and Wilson, um, that uh, um, uh, Will Wilson didn't realize how important his discovery was until he read the article in the New York Times by Walter Sullivan uh, saying that what they discovered was the afterglow of creation. He'd been so worried about the technicality, he hadn't realized that. And so uh, that's an example where one does get a better perspective if one does uh, explain one's work to a wider audience. So I think there's a lot to be said for the research university. But having said that, um, I think it, the model is being stressed. Um, and uh, uh, I wrote an article for a British magazine a couple of years ago uh, explaining uh, what was going wrong because in universities, um, there's more of an audit culture, promotion is slow, et cetera. And the editor entitled the, the article, why I'm young, why I'm not, sorry, why I'm glad I'm not a young academic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's because if, if I think of the time when I was starting, and this would have been true if I'd been in America in the same way. Um, there'd been a burst of university expansion in the 1960s. Um, the young outnumbered the old. There was still a retiring age. And so promotion was quite quick. Um, now, uh, there's far more of an audit culture in both of our countries. And promotion is slow um, because uh, there are so many people. And um, it's even worse, actually, in the US in biomedical areas because there was a survey a few years ago which showed that the average age at which people in those fields got their first NIH grant was 43. 43, yeah. That contrasted with uh, uh, the earlier situation. Uh, Shirley Tillman, who was the president of Princeton and a contemporary of mine, she said that she did a PhD in three years, three years as a postdoc, and then got her first grant. You can't do that now. And my worry is that because of this uh, um, slow promotion and congestion in academia, there's a serious problem because the ones who will stay are the nerds who can't do anything else. Mm -hmm. But we want to keep in academia at least some fraction of people who are ambitious and flexible, people who want to feel they've achieved something individually by their 30s. And that's far less possible in academia now than it was. And this is, I think, a big worry. Yeah, and I think, uh, It's because of the uh, uh, amount of time people have to spend in grant applications because... Um, Whereas until the 70s, there was expansion, so the young outnumber the old. That's no longer the case. Yeah, and I've, I've spoken with uh, a few folks. I think I spoke to Jim Akalili about this and, and others yeah. about, you know, how, how to rectify it. And, and some of it was, you know, mandatory actual retirement. I mean, we have people here, uh, I was showing you before we uh, before we started recording, you know, I'm in uh, Jeffrey Burbage's old office here, and I've got some of Margaret Burbage's, you know, here's a spectrum of a uh, spiral galaxy, which showed Doppler shift that she ended up teaching to Vera Rubin. Um, yeah. And then Vera Rubin, while she was here for a year, learned from the the two of them and and went on to great fame and success. Um, but I wanted to um, to kind of uh, you know then again pivot once again back to uh, a, another direction, which is um, which is you know kind of this the role of of incentivization in science. Uh, mm -hmm. You talk a little bit about you know citation counts and all these metrics that we've you know really only come about in earnest in the last, you know, few decades, I'm thinking of, you know, for one thing, the H index, which is the H and I don't know if you knew this, but the H and H index comes from Jorge Hirsch, who's a uh, theoretical physicist at UC San Diego, who has a paper about, which ironically has the most citations, I think of any of his papers. <laughs> um, but this has become, you know, what, what, you know, uh, computer geeks call, you know, gamification, you know, I've got this watch and it tells me how many steps I took today. And if it does, if I don't, if I get to 10,000 steps, I get some like animation, it feels good. Um, and of course in science, you know, the ultimate, you know, prize, the ultimate accolade, the ultimate, you know, um, uh, gamified responses to, you know, there comes a limit to, you can't get double tenure. You can't get, you know, multiple, uh, you know, write multiple papers on the same theme. So it becomes ever escalation from along their academic rank up the academic rank to different national academies. And then maybe if you're lucky, um, you know, when Barry Barish was here a couple of months ago, he left this here, Martin, uh, this is his Nobel, pr no, it's, it's just a piece of chocolate. Uh, but um, I want to go and analyze it, judge one more book by its cover. And that's, if you'll indulge me, that's this book. Um, losing the Nobel Prize, yes, um, which is written by yours truly. But it says in the back uh, by by you, you were kind enough to give me 
one of the first blurbs. In this riveting personal account, Brian Keating writes, writes frankly of the challenges, frustrations, and motivations during the years spent building and operating instruments to tackle one of the fundamental problems in science, how our universe began. And I'm so grateful for that, Martin. But since that time, you and I have communicated many times and and you told me you love the book, but you really wish I didn't spend so much time on the Nobel Prize uh, oh, because yeah. you are of the and I quote you in the book and and I think it, you know our ideas are in resonance. But um, can you explain for the audience why why you thought that was a mistake, perhaps for me? And and I you know I, I, I I'm no way offended by it. I, I I'm eternally grateful for for your attention and and kind words and your encomium. But um but why do you think it was a mistake to maybe focus? more on that rather than, I don't want to turn this into my favorite subject, which is me, but, um, but why do you think it was a, it was maybe mistaken to spend, you know, focus on the Nobel prize as itself, as they, as they did in three of the 11 chapters? Yes. Um, well, I was surprised at your perception that most scientists are motivated by that. They are in some fields I know, and, uh, it's, it's very damaging. It leads to real nastiness in some competitive fields. Um, but, uh, to go back to what we were saying earlier, um, science is often um, uh, uh, assessed by these uh, um, indicators like citations and all that, uh, which are perverse uh, indicators because they don't measure what's really important. Right. Um, and uh, uh, I, I suppose the aim is that these prizes do. Um, but um, my, my concern really is about the public perception of Nobel Prizes, um, because the public assumes that the people who win the prizes are all sort of near geniuses, and they've made some great individual achievement. And it uh, uh, is misleading in a number of ways. Well, first, um, uh, any scientist builds on the work of others. It's never true to say that the guy who scores the goal in football uh, he did it by himself. He was helped by the rest of the team. And that's true of all science. And some science is uh, intrinsically collaborative, involving a very large team of collaborators. So that, that's one thing, but that's not, not properly recommend, uh, recognized by Nobel Prizes, although it is by some other prizes that have been set up more recently. Um, so that, that's one issue. Um, the second uh, issue is that um, uh, people who get Nobel Prizes are then... Uh, regarded as at least uh, uh, B-list celebrities, uh, <laughs> and their views are sought on fields where they have no expertise, and they're given greater weight. Uh, and uh, and th this is um, misleading because they don't have special authority. And of course, one knows that one can find a Nobel Prize winner to support almost any kind of eccentricity. So, uh, uh, so many of them do. And of course, um, some of them are indeed brilliant. I mean, you know. Stephen Weinberg was obviously a brilliant person, you know, uh, who, who deserved everything he got. Um, but uh, a lot are just lucky, like Penz and Wilson um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, other people who um, uh, get, 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 get the prize for making some discovery, which may be because they had access to a special piece of equipment or just serendipity. And so uh, the, the um, criteria for giving the prize are to recognize an important advance, and it normally succeeds in doing that, but it doesn't give the public a feeling for how an advance is achieved. It's not just one genius working away at it. There are lots of people in parallel. And um, uh, I give, um, in my sec section of the book where I discuss this, um, two examples uh, where uh, I, I think it, it went wrong. Uh, w one was the, uh, the Higgs boson, uh, which uh, uh, um, the, the, the last paper was came from Higgs, but it's accepted that there were six people who worked on it mm -hmm. independently, and they were built on earlier people like Phil Anderson. Uh, so lots of people are involved. Um, and um, knowing some of these people, I think it's clear that um, uh, the, the person among those six who had the most distinguished career overall was someone called Tom Kibble in yeah. London. Yeah. Um, he was a highly respected scientist, and he didn't get the prize. Right. Uh, although he had a, a far more distinguished overall career. Um, that's what, one thing. And the other example is uh, uh, the case which uh, you're familiar with, uh, one of the few cases where they've given a prize uh, related to fu fundamental science derived from astronomy. This was the evidence for the accelerating universe. And here they gave it to two teams. There were 50 or 15 or 20 people in each team 
and they gave it to three people, one in one team, two in the other team. Yeah. And I won't see why they chose those people. They're great guys. Um, but uh, that's a case where it should have gone to the whole team. And uh, it's misleading to regard those three people who got the prize as the great intellects. Indeed, I could um, identify at least four people in the teams whose overall record is more substantial than that of any of the three people who got the prize. Hmm. Yeah. And um, we've had uh, two of the three uh, winners have been on the podcast. I'm still waiting for Saul to come on. Uh, uh, hopefully someday that, that might happen. But, but you know, on the other hand, to be devil's advocate, you know, I think <laughs> Nobel's advocate, uh, I, I don't think he ever intended it to, to take on the prominence that it did have. And again, we're talking today is the, uh, the first of Nobel season, which is October 3rd, or the prize uh, for medicine or physiology was awarded to um, Svant Pavo. I think it's, I, it's too many umlauts. I, I, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't be expected. Good to choice. <laughs> good choice. Yeah. Mm. So it was, it was good and um, very distant knowledge of, of him. Hopefully I can get him on. Um, but, but the you know kind of history of Nobel prizes are a little bit uh, a little bit a rogues gallery as as you point out. Not only are there things uh, that are you know factually incorrect, say Bohr's model of a mini planetary system for the atom, which had predictive power, but ultimately we we know now is not the correct description of the quantum realm. Um, but uh, or you know some say Fermi's uh, Nobel Prize is not, not quite uh, rightly deserved. But but speaking of medicine, uh, the lobotomy uh, was awarded with the Nobel Prize, and and now that's regarded as essentially barbaric. Uh, but even going further back in time to 1918, the Chemistry Prize, which you uh, mentioned in this book, was given to uh, Fritz Haber, uh, who was uh, a German Jew who ended up making uh, the chemical weapons and overseeing it with six other Nobel Prize winners. And I have a video about this in my channel. I'll put a link to it called "Knowledge Is Not Equal to Wisdom," <laughs> because mm -hmm. as it turned out, Haber. Has, he went on to have a factory that went on to produce Zyklon B, which was mm -hmm. the gas that gassed most of the Jews in the Holocaust, including members of his own family that perished under, um, mm -hmm. you know, his uh, his his inventions. And I, I wonder, Martin, we do venerate, you know, inventors. Uh, maybe that's you know partially the the genesis or or etymology of that word. Um, the the Tim the the Steve Jobs is the you know the the um, mm -hmm. even the Alfred Nobels. And is that something innate? in human beings that we need like a hero, you know, we have sports heroes, we have, um, we have, uh, you know, other heroes on, in theater and in, in, in movies. Um, what's wrong with having, you know, a scientist hero that, that people look up to, uh, is it, or is it putting like just too much pressure on a single individual? As you say, most of these are team discoveries, although Svant today's winner won it by himself, which was kind of <laughs> interesting to me, but, but what do you make of that, that the, the ideal, you know, to kind of idolize, um, it just runs in human nature and we'll never get around it. So maybe we, um, you know, should just make do with the Nobel Prize and all its flaws. Well, I mean, I agree with you. If they are the people who really are exceptional, I mean, uh, uh, of recent ones, I would put Stephen Weinberg in that category, for instance. Uh, and no, would deny he was an exceptional intellect. And, and there are quite a few who are like that. Um, and Kip Thorne, I put in that category too. Um, so there are quite a number. Uh, but but my objection is that uh, many of them uh, aren't uh, in that category at all. Uh, they're uh, no more distinguished in in general than the average academic in a university in some cases. Um, and uh, I think many of them realize this. In fact, I, I remember talking to um, uh, uh, a Californian uh, uh, particle physicist who got the prize, and he said, "He said to me, I think I'm the dumbest Nobel Prize winner." I said, and then he went to say, "No, sorry, I correct that. I'm the dumbest physics Nobel Prize winner. There are several chemists who are dumber." <laughs> That's right. There's uh, always room to to tease chemists, as Dirac was wont to do as well. Yeah. Um, well, I want to I want to now turn to an um, to run some ideas by you. So you're you're quite um, critical, rightfully so. Uh, in many ways, about the the modern journal 
um, uh, kind of framework where we have the archive and you talk about Ginsburg, you know, Cornell and his monument and, and also the Simons Foundation should be recognized for their support of it um, uh, with they don't get any, you know, money in return from it. They don't make more, uh, you know, on their hedge fund uh, profits, as far as I know. Uh, but it's it's basic pure scientific philanthropy. Uh, and yet we hear things that, you know, it's it's not good for people to say, start other types of prizes like the Breakthrough Prize, or even funding like the Simons Foundation, or the Gordon Moore Foundation and others, where you put so much of scientific prioritization in the hands of, you know, maybe eccentric billionaires, it, you know, it, it, could, it could turn out that they're collecting, you know, like Howard Hughes has one of the most, you know, you mentioned in the book how successful it's been. He was pretty eccentric billionaire. I think it's safe to call him that. I don't think it's a spoiler to anybody. Um, so. Do you worry about that, uh, the prioritization being set by non-governmental agencies? Um, no, well, you, you conflated two or three different things. I did, I did. I, um, right. I wanted to say, first of all, I think the, the archive is great. Yes. Um, and uh, I think perhaps the age of the journal um, is coming to a close. Um, we need some kind of quality control, um, yeah. but uh, that can come from the archive, especially if we introduce something new, like, for instance, the restaurant critics who can give a star to mm. a paper which they like. Um, and uh, if if your paper on the archive gets stars, which must not be anonymous, they must be signed by the person given them. If the stars are from people who are respected in the field, right? then that's to the genuine credit of the paper. And uh, young people who can't read all the literature will then tend to read papers which have got stars from reputable people. And so that's, that would be a way of bypassing uh, the refereeing. And I think um, uh, refereeing actually it's a worse problem in the humanities and in economics than it is in science, because in the, in uh, economics, there are a few journals which uh, allegedly carry greater prestige and a would-be academic has to get at least one paper in one of those journals. Uh, I think we're not quite in that state in, in our sciences. No. Um, I think the, the archive is, is, is great. Um, and I think also young academics should in promotion criteria uh, be able to include not just the papers they've written, but good blogs they've written and public lectures and all these things. And YouTube channels, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, I think all, all those things. There's hope for be. me to win the YouTube uh, Nobel Prize. But the, the other question you asked was about the, uh, the role of private sponsorship. And um, uh, I think this is welcome. I mean, it, the, the, pro the problems may arise if the uh, donor uh wants to control uh the um framework and of course most academic organizations um have criteria where they would not allow that to happen that uh, if if someone endows a chair they normally aren't allowed to uh, be on the appointment committee for the chair for instance and so as long as those uh, rules are, are followed then i think one should hugely welcome this and um uh if simon's is probably the, the biggest foundation in the physical sciences and there are others and there's an outfit called the philanthropic alliance mm -hmm. which was set up a few years ago with the aim of encouraging wealthy people to consider um donations to uh physical sciences right. of course astronomy has had a head start because i think if you look back at the us who built your telescopes it was mainly private sponsors. Well, so I think we can look back to this guy. We can look back to Galileo. You know, he didn't yes. build telescopes, but his discoveries were named after his patrons, right? Yes, yes. Mm. Um, but, but I think um, uh, astronomy has been more favored than any other physical sciences, indeed, any other non, -bi non medical sciences in terms of private sponsorship. Um, but I think it's very good that uh, there should be private sponsorship to give a diversity of support. And I think it's especially important given that um, the pressure on, um, in, in your country, the NSF, in my country, UKRI, is getting greater and um, rather vexatious in the number of forms you have to fill in to, to get a grant and then to process the grant when you've got it. So I think it's very good that there are these varied sources of support. Yeah, and then there are things like the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, on which you've served as a trustee, um uh just to pivot back i'm sorry it's 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 you know it's always a wild ride when you're when you're talking to a to a, a new yorker like myself but um but going back 
to the journals. Uh, I wondered if I could maybe uh, you and I could could flesh out some possible alternatives because you know it's it's not good and you never do this. You never just criticize. You always have solutions that you talk about. One solution that's getting a lot of attention, and especially on as you know from being a guest on Lex Friedman's podcast. Um, we won't talk about aliens. Uh, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> almost every uh, podcast he does involves aliens. But another major subject is is blockchain or you know Bitcoin technology. And I've been thinking a little bit about that and how we could use the blockchain type technology to not circumvent journals, but there are legitimate cases in the bicep affair that I write about in the book you so kindly blurbed. Uh, we had this, you know, debate on the team, like, can we submit it to nature, you know, and, or, you know, in, in the end, we ended up submitting a 25 page long paper to FizzRev letters, uh, which is the longest in history. And they've never repeated that since. And maybe that's a good thing, but you know, for nature, they wanted all these embargoes that we couldn't release the day. We couldn't have a press conference until uh until it was accepted for publication so they did read it and i, I believe those I, I wasn't in the senior leadership by this moment so i may get the details wrong but um but that was part of the reason we didn't want to embargo it we wanted to get it out as soon as possible such that a referee might not want to be able to scoop us with the advanced knowledge of of you know what our results were because they were so dramatically above the expectation of everybody including you would have predicted for the tensor to scalar ratio mm -hmm. um so it was a conscious now what if you had a blockchain and encoded when it was like you know what leonardo or galileo used to do when he discovered what he thought were three moons around saturn uh he mm -hmm. said the, the the highest planet is threefold or something and has ears uh, mm -hmm. it wrote cryptically and Leonardo wrote in the mirror. Um, what if you could encrypt things in a blockchain so that, you know, bicep has discovered that the, the primordial, I, it could be really poetic. It could be really cool. You know, the, the reverberations are the 20% uh, of the me, you know, whatever. I don't know. We could make a joke about it, but, but in all mm -hmm. seriousness, could you envision some way of establishing priority, which is like it or not important for scientists? Um, sometimes generated by things that aren't so important, like winning the Nobel Prize, but but nevertheless, priority is important for careers and such. Um, so what could we do um, to circumvent this ossified, you know, 100, how old is nature, you know, for example, 160 years old or something? Um, it's pretty much unchanged, just like much of academia. So I want to ask you, could we, could you envision a state where you could encode, you know, maybe even clinical trials or, or things that would be open source, uh, but it would also establish um, reproducibility, but it would also establish priority. Is there any hope for that? Well, I mean, I'm not sure how often priority is important. I mean, it's only important <laughs> if you're in a field where uh, I'd have thought it's frustrating that you're only making a discovery a month before someone else would do it. <laughs> I mean, it's not better to be in a field where uh, you feel you're making a distinctive difference and no one else is competing with you. So I think people should stay away from the fields where they have to worry about <laughs> being scooped by someone a month later. Well, uh, you, but I'm sorry, Martin, I have to push back uh, with respect. In this book, you talk about the difference between science and art. And you say something like if Botticelli never made whatever he made, uh, then no one would have made it. But if yes. Einstein didn't have his Annus Mirabilis, he, someone else would have done it. Maybe it would have been later. Maybe it would have been Minkowski and, and you know, who knows, but... Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? Uh, I mean, well, that there is a prior to, there is a rush in science and some competitive. Well, they, they, would do it, they would do it later, but to, to take the case of Einstein, if he hadn't existed, then his work would have been done over the next decade or two, probably by several different people, not one single great mind. Yes. Um, but, but I, th I, th I think um, uh, it, it would be okay, I just thought, in most cases. I mean, for instance, Bicep, mm -hmm. um, that, that was a, a, a unique facility. No one else was going to be able to do. Do that and scoop and scoop you, um, and and so uh, you could have published the, the paper. Um, and well, it's 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 um, just again to just uh, in terms of the the actual event. So we had we had been worried that the Planck satellite actually could have seen it. And actually, George Epstadio, who you know undoubtedly very well at your institution, yes. um, who's coming to, uh, I'm going to meet with him hopefully in New York in a couple months. Uh, he's mm -hmm. he's uh, a renowned scientist. He had written a paper not too long before, a few years before, that said that they had the capability to measure the same signal as us, but at higher statistical significance. So we And they wouldn't share their data with us on the foreground. So it started to make us think, well, maybe they know something. And um, but, but anyway, I interrupted. I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, but it, I don't think it's strictly true that nobody could have, if it were really as high as 20% of the scalar contributions, they would have seen it. 
Yes, um, but but the other the other point I, I was going to make is that um, uh, uh, refereeing is only important for a uh, uh, long, difficult-looking paper, which uh, students might waste a lot of time reading. And then proves wrong. Um, any high-profile paper um, will get far more discussion um, on the web or coffee time in institutions the day it appears on the archive. I mean, I think that's true of any exciting paper that appears on the archive. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the the intensity of the criticism it gets within a day or two from mm -hmm. all the people who read it and discuss it um, at the water cooler or coffee and all that is going to be greater. So the refereeing is not important. And and I think um, uh, that has had the result, I think, that in uh, many cases, um, the paper on, on, the, uh, on the archive um, has been modified um, when it's in its final form, uh, but not by referees, but by general input and the view that some particular aspect of it was a bit dubious. And so uh, I think it's only for papers which are not going to attract much attention mm -hmm. that refereeing is essential to keep standards up. Mm -hmm. If it's important, then everyone's going to read it and comment on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Um, so I want to turn now to, well, first of all, I want to uh, remind people as my podcast obligation uh, as has uh, spelled out in the Geneva Convention, I must remind people every hour who we're speaking to, and it's such a treat to speak with uh, a hero uh, and, a, and, a, and a great friend of, as I say, Universities of California, San Diego, uh, UC System, uh, and uh, and all of science, as, as well as a uh, personal hero to yours truly, and that's Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, uh, author of many, many books. Uh, I first got introduced to you in the, in the 90s, Martin. Um, and your wonderful book, uh, Just Six Numbers, really revolutionary, winner of the Templeton Prize, um, along with uh, uh, Freeman Dyson, who was our first guest on the podcast. I don't know if you knew that, uh, Lord That's Martin, good. that Freeman was my first guest, and you quote him in your wonderful uh, annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics. You said, when I received the Templeton Prize, he told me that made him feel better about having won it himself, as I'd just done as little to deserve it as he had. Of course, you add, I've done far less. Now, Freeman was a wonderful, a wonderful man and and um and really a great friend. I remember introducing him to my um my he must have been five year old and and Freeman was born exactly 90 years almost to the day uh before my four year old. So they were like, you know, talking about but they, he could talk about anything. It was uh it was he's such a he's such a, a titanic mind and I, I miss him uh terribly. He's been gone a few years now. Um, but, you know, one of the things that he and I used to talk about on the couple of episodes that he honored me with is the difference between, you know, mysteries and puzzles, a mystery being uh, something that is uh, that is perhaps in, inscrutable that you cannot understand mm -hmm. and a puzzle, which is something that you might not. I mean, I'm not talking about you, but I might not be able to solve a crossword puzzle in the Sunday Times, but my mother can, or, or, you know, my kid can solve a Rubik's cube. I can't really do that. Um, so they're soluble, but not maybe by you, but mysteries are perhaps forever inscrutable, according to Freeman. And I kind of added on my own little twitch twist to that, which is that like the meaning of life as a scientist was to convert as many mysteries as possible into puzzles, uh, because, you know, we like to solve things. And, and I wonder, Martin, if you could think about the most mysterious thing that remains in science, and the greatest puzzle. You've solved so many puzzles, Martin. Um, it's really just like you're like they used to say about Stephen Hawking. They thought he was Bourbaki, yeah, a collective. But you've done so many things. What's your favorite puzzle? And what's your favorite mystery that still lingers perhaps forever? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'll give the same answer that probably most cosmologists would give, which is that um, we can trace back with confidence to when the universe had been expanding for just a microsecond. Because after the first microsecond, the physics is is known. But in the first microsecond, particles are moving around with energies higher than we can readily achieve in accelerators. Um, but many of the key features of the universe, as we all accept, were laid down at a far, far earlier stage still, uh, to put it in perspective, um, when the universe was uh, a, a microsecond old, the observable universe was about the size of the solar system, whereas when all the action happened, the universe was the size of a tennis ball and had expanded for something microscopic. And so that's a huge jump from the physics we understand. And uh, uh, this is um, 
a challenge. And I think the question is, will this be forever a mystery or will we be able to um, understand this physics? Because obviously people are working on string theory and all the rest of it. And let's hope that we can uh, probe one stage deeper because it's amazing that in the 50 years when I've been active in science, we've gone from not knowing whether there was a big bang at all uh, to knowing in quite a lot of detail uh, how it evolved right back uh, from a microsecond to the present. Um, but but I think the fundamental laws of nature, um, which may be represented by string theory or maybe something quite different, it's possible that they could be beyond the capacity of human brains. Hmm. Quite, quite possible. Um, and of course, uh, one can then ask, would AI be able to, to solve them? And and this is, I think, a, po a possible scenario. It could be that the the maths of the ten dimensional spaces and the geometry is too hard for a human to work through, but some kind of maybe not present but future AI could work through it all. And if the AI, uh, after chucking away, uh, came out at the end with the correct mass for the electron or some correct numbers for the now un known parameters of the standard model, then we'd know it was on the right track. Mm. And we'd never, though, get the real insight, which uh, is the main satisfaction of science, when, in retrospect, something looks obvious to you. This would never look obvious to you, uh, mm. but this might be the only way we would understand these. But there might be, as I say, aspects of physical reality which um, are beyond us, uh, just as uh, quantum theory is beyond a monkey. Yeah. That's, that's a possibility. Yeah, and no. go ahead. We've, got to, we've then got to realize that one thing we learn as astronomers, um, and this is one, I think, particular um, attitude that astronomers can bring to uh, public discourse in general, is that the future is as long as the past. I mean, most people are aware that we're the outcome of nearly 4 billion years of, of biological evolution, but many tend to feel that we're the top of the tree, we're these combinations of this, uh, whereas, of course, we know in astronomy, that the sun's less than halfway through its life and the universe will go on for much, much, much longer. And so um, we, we are aware that there are all kinds of emergent properties uh, which will make the future far more amazing than the present. Yeah, and I wonder, you mentioned <clears throat> artificial intelligence and I can't uh, resist running you know, this analogy by you, which is um, this, this gentleman who you mentioned a couple of minutes back, Albert Einstein. Uh, do you recall what he called his happiest thought, Martin? Um, it was the the elevator. Yes, yes, it was yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, if he yeah. pre-fell, yeah, yeah, he would yeah. experience no gravitational yeah. force. So I want to ask you, to what extent could AI Einstein, AI AE, could it, them, Z, experience A, a happiest thought, and B, a sensation that's anthropomorphic of falling? In other words, do we have anything to worry about? I mean, the primitive nature of AI at this point seems, you know, painfully obvious. I mean, Elon Musk, who you always lovingly refer to as, you know, wanting to die on Mars, but you hope that he doesn't die on impact. I, I love that line. I always attribute it to you. Uh, but, you know, Elon revealed these AI bots that can lift up packages and it's great and it's wonderful. They're doing trillions of computations per second. But is that the ghost in the machine, um, or as your, you know, rival, uh, rival university, Oxford, uh, and Oxonian, Sir Roger Penrose has been a guest many times on the show, uh, really think that the brain isn't a computer at all. Um, where do you fall in that kind of dichotomy? Is the brain a computer well, or no? One comment on Roger Penrose's idea, although it is amazing that at age 91, yeah. he's the first guy with his ideas as ever. He's yeah. a really great, great guy. Um, but but I think um, I, I'd answer in two ways. I mean, I, I think it's clear that um, AI um, uh, d does have superhuman powers to do restricted things, playing Go and all that. Um, but that's very different, as you're saying, uh, from uh, general intelligence. And so I, I think um, in, in order to uh, have the sort of general intelligence, it's got to actually interact with the external world. Because, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we've heard recently about uh, these um, AIs that can uh, digest billions of pages of print and they can write what looked like ser serious, sensible paragraphs, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't have any uh, concept of the things that those words denote. They just know which words are tied together in particular ways. 
and that's why they can write sensible uh, sentences. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a it's a, going to be a long time before machines can interact with the external world directly. Mm. Not yeah. if, if they were to discover new laws of nature, that would be necessary, I think, to mm. interact with the external world. Um, but even if they they can do that, um, then of course um, there's the fundamental phys problem of philosophers uh, um, whether uh, capability implies self-awareness and consciousness um, and uh, and that's an open question go with the famous philosopher of Berkeley Searle of course would have argued it didn't and so it's I think still an open question whether the uh, AI even if it has superhuman capabilities in many directions whether it's got self-awareness mm -hmm. and, right. and uh, able to uh, uh, have emotions as it were we just don't know yeah, I see it very reminiscent of sort of the Drake equation, uh, where we kind of po you know put these a posteriori expectations of what an AI or an alien you know would look like or do, and we really have no idea whatsoever. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, I proposed the Drake equation. I told the uh, Nick Bostrom over there at Oxford, yeah, he should come up with Bostrom equation, and and uh, he's pretty dismissive. He, he doesn't like the Drake equation, and um, you know, all, no, no disrespect I, to the late great Frank Drake. Give you my, my take, which is discussed in my, my, another book, um, that um, uh, I think the Drake equation um, is rather misleading because if we think of what's happened on the Earth, it's taken four billion years, and we've got a technological civilization of flesh and blood creatures. But in the four billion years ahead, then maybe we will be usurped by electronic entities. Right. They'd be near immortal and they won't uh, unless you want to stay on the planet at all. And so they they, they won't be deterred by interstellar voyages. And so um, if we imagine that there was another Earth uh, where life had evolved as on the Earth, then only if it was very, very closely synchronized would we observe it during this interval of just a few centuries when it's got a technological flesh and blood civilization. Either it'll be well behind us, in which case we see no evidence of intelligence, or it'll be well ahead, in which case what we will see or detect will be the electronic remote progeny of that civilization. Mm. And uh, this is, um, uh, I think, a, a very serious necessary modification of the Drake equation because um, th that the progeny may exist for billions of years, um, even if the... Uh, uh, civilization in the flesh and blood sense only lasts for thousands of years. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm optimistic about SETI detecting some kind of artifacts. But if it does, then I think they're more likely to be uh, electronic artifacts left by some long dead civilization. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, that's great to hear that fully fleshed out. Um, I wonder if we could go in the you know remaining time that we have to some of the details of the book. Although I have to say, I always hated it when I'd go on a conversation and someone said, you know, can you summarize the book entirely so that I don't have to read it and my audience doesn't have to buy? It? No, I want you to buy this book in as many formats as possible because it is uh, it's a slim, easy read. Uh, I actually had it read to me as I explained to Lord Martin, by none other than Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, by taking a, uh, a PDF, converting it to Speechify and selecting her premium voice. And it is uh, as as lugubrious as you would expect. Uh, it's, it's, it's blurbed on the back by a uh, past guest on the podcast, my podcast, Stephen Pinker, uh, author of Rationality at Harvard University, with whom Lord Martin has collaborated on several uh, on several articles. Uh, Stephen called it a judicious and timely presentation of nothing less than how to save the world from one of our wisest scientists and public voices. And I should say that Martin um, is available uh, 24 seven, if you like, if you go to the twitter.com website where he is Lord Martin, and you can get all his uh, hot takes on uh, Manchester United, on Adele. Uh, no, no, you can't get that. But you'll get uh, his greatest uh, uh, thoughts that fit into 280 characters. Um, and I wonder, Martin, uh, speaking of Twitter, which you joined a few years ago, um, and uh, and I, I delightfully follow you. Um, I want to I want to kind of think as a practicing scientist and and go back uh, even further, you know, than than the names that we've mentioned so far, and, and go back to to um, John Clerk Maxwell, uh, or James Clerk Maxwell, rather, uh, Scotsman, 
and and his theory of electromagnetism and his famous eponymous four equations uh, of electromagnetism, which uh, are undoubtedly true and tested, you know, perhaps as as good as human beings will ever be able to test and prove and verify and hold across the cosmos. Uh, but but um, but Maxwell was troubled, uh, wasn't he, by the fact that uh, he didn't see a mechanism by which these waves could be transmitted, and so he proposed that there were a series of vortices and gears and and all sorts of you know strange phenomena that we know don't exist uh, later would be kind of deemed the ether and that that would later be rejected in the michelson morley experiment center um can you imagine uh you know uh, james clerk maxwell on twitter so he comes up with these ideas and these equations and then he, and then below what he goes through is oh, well this is instantiated by these gears and and fluxions and and bitch, you know virtuous luminiferous ether, um, he'd be a laughing stock, right? I mean that's ah, crazy. You know, Hertz would prove him wrong a couple. But would we throw the baby out with the bathwater? And I guess I'm wondering nowadays, um, there are voices that are not in the majority. These are people that don't believe uh, necessarily in a quantum singularity and origin of the universe. These aren't crackpots. These are you know friends of the show like Paul Steinhardt and Aegis, Neil Turok, who was just on this past week, um, the Higgs professor at uh, at James Clerk Maxwell's alma mater, right uh, at the uh, University of Edinburgh. Um, I said Edinburgh on my inner. I was so embarrassed, Martin. But but anyway, um, imagine are we stifling voices by this kind of instantaneous need to to you know put things on Twitter and and have gotcha moments and and you don't engage in it. I'm not implying at all that that's no. your Twitter account's focus, right? But no. um, are we perhaps stifling you know by the thought of public embarrassment maybe some really good ideas like paul is not on you know <laughs> neil is not on uh on twitter etc cetera, etc cetera. and i wonder if that's a good thing or a bad thing has, has twitter been a net positive for science not just for you know getting the hottest takes in the royal family and what kate middleton is doing today what, what do you think is the benefit and and maybe pitfalls of twitter or social media in general well i mean i, I don't think twitter's very important in science i mean i, I think uh, uh certain blogs are important um, and uh, uh, and should be encouraged. Um, but I think on the question you ask about uh, uh, you know minority views, um, I think it's very indeed very important to encourage them. And there, uh, that's why um, I do hope that, that um, uh, despite what I said about science becoming unattractive as a career because it's, it's an overcrowded universities, I hope some of those who uh, don't do science and go and work in a startup will make enough money to become independent scientists. I mean, in the 19th century, there were independent scientists like uh, uh, Darwin and Rayleigh, but they were independently wealthy. But there can be people now uh, who um, uh, make enough money by the time they're 40 and they can become independent scientists. And that would be good because that will provide a greater diversity of opinion. There's a risk of groupthink, obviously, in the universities. And of course, there's a clustering tendency because if we think about um, uh, speculative theories like string theory, et cetera, uh, then, as you know, the rival theories, loop quantum gravity and others. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems is that if you're uh, a career academic, then you want to write papers that quite a lot of people will read. And that therefore means as a clustering tendency, you tend to focus on what's already the, uh, um, the most heavily studied option. Whereas, in fact, we want the reverse to happen. We want people to uh, uh, spread out their efforts. Um, and uh, the, the trouble is that the uh, the risk to get a lot of readers is contrary to to that. It's right. pressing the wrong way. Right. And and yeah, I mean, it's it's one of these things that, I mean, interestingly enough, it does have some, you know, geopolitical. I mean, today, Elon, you're you're one of your frequent subjects of uh of bemusement it was tweeting about you know here's how can we uh do you agree this is how the ukraine war should end and you know annexation of crimea should be uh, ratified and this and that uh, i was and vote on it and he's like you have to vote again and and make sure you vote <laughs> uh yeah. and like at some level i'm sure somebody's listening to what he says i mean he's an awfully influential person it is, uh, yes mm -hmm. um yeah. so another theme in this book and it's been a constant theme with many of your fellow countrymen uh, and and that is uh, folks like Tim Palmer, who's uh, got a new book coming out and was on the show a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that video should be out by the time this video is out. Uh, and uh, and also I had on um, uh, I had on uh, Neil Ferguson, uh, who is a Scotsman, I guess. That, you know, I don't know if you can 
consider Scotsman part of uh, the UK. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how any of that works. So it's more complicated than CMB cosmology, which we'll get to, as well as audience questions. So uh, some of my audience asks you some questions. We're going to get to those at the very end. In the next few minutes, we're going to wrap up so you can have a good supper and proper supper indeed. Um, but... No, uh, no. Okay. Uh, so Neil uh, and Tim, and now you have um, have discussed the the kind of intermeshing of two vast forces, which one of which you might not have written about had this book come out three years and five days ago or something. And that's COVID-19 and uh, also uh, global warming, which obviously has been around for a very long time. Um, when I talk with with both of them, they they uh, Tim and Neil uh, discussed, and it's not the Neil Ferguson at I think at Imperial who came up with this drastic forecast, uh, which uh, which didn't thankfully turn out to be true for UK deaths. But anyway, it's the other one, the the Scottish historian and and so forth at the Hoover Institution in America. Anyway, uh, the two of them um, write that these are intertwined in some way, perhaps by the efficacy of the global response or inefficacy um and, and perhaps by you know one of the few things that can unite a planet perhaps but but uh, it doesn't seem to be too successful and in, in, in that um I want to I want to take take myself back and my listeners back um to January of 2020 I was at a Shabbat dinner a Friday night dinner with some friends and one of my friends told me uh because I told him I'm going to visit this CMB observatory in uh in Tibet that the Chinese are building and they want me to to see it and give a tour and so forth. And I was excited. I'd never been to Tibet or China at all. Uh, so I was happily going to do this. And in January of 2020, my friend said, well, you better postpone it. When is it going to be? And I said, April. And he said, oh, no, you better postpone it till like July because there's a thing called COVID-19 and they're dealing with it. And and he was joking. Yeah, they welded about 10,000 people inside of a hospital prison. And well, that's kind of weird, but I'm not going to be in Beijing. So I don't care. I'll just be in this nice, safe place called Tibet. And he's like, yeah, you should still think about it. Um, and yet, Martin, here in America, you know, if my friend, you know, some, you know, uh, in my, in, and me, a Yenta, uh, at, a, at a dinner party in January, knew enough to know that there was this global response, and the P, or at least in China, there was this drastic response, and people were taking incredible, you know, precautions and so forth. Um, you would think that the multi-trillion dollar three-letter agencies here um, and in there, you know, I mean, uh, we have NSA, DARPA, DOE, NSA, all these agencies blew it and and they're scientists. Right. So they didn't save us. And, and there you have what MI6, as I understand, that, you know, James. But no, I, I don't I don't mean to imply that. But but other institutions, science funding institutions, did anyone get it right? A. And how can we save face after, you know, saying, well, we kind of blew it on COVID-19, science included. But certainly the military and the and these huge budgets, but mm. but trust us on global warming. We got it this time. You know, we, we, our models, our forecasts, our computer simulations, they didn't work so well for for this uh, pandemic. But yeah. they're going to work much better fifty to hundred years from now with global warming. What do you say to such a? Uh, well, I think I think what you said about uh, uh, the attitude to COVID nineteen is very unfair. I mean, it's true that uh, uh, the uh, uh, lockdowns and things were. Um, perhaps uh, instigated too late. But I would say it showed science at its best because uh, the uh, scientific experts, certainly in the UK, they're on television every day with the prime minister uh, giving their views and they're respected. Um, and the uh, scientific effort was international and the uh, vaccine project was amazingly successful when we don't have a vaccine for uh, HIV after 40 years. Mm -hmm. So I would say it was a, a great achievement. And the public got a sort of education in science because early on, uh, the um, uh, um, way the disease was transmitted was unclear. There was a lot of debate about whether wearing masks was important or waste of time, etc. And these things get gradually firmed up and the public could watch this happening. So I would say this was a case when scientists were listened to um, because uh, uh, they did deliver um, and there was urgency. I think if you take global warming, which is in a sense a, a slow motion version of a catastrophe, uh, then the point is that um, uh, the worst of it is far beyond the horizons, the time horizons of politicians. And of course, in parts of the world, very far away from uh, the UK and the US. Um, and so that that's why um, action is um, uh, very hard uh, to uh, implement and to get public support for. And I think in the case of uh, uh, climate change, um, 
I think there's now a consensus about the science, um, but I think the question of what to do about it and how urgent it is to respond and the balance of mitigation and adaptation, uh, that's a matter for proper debate. Um, but I think um, the main thing that's lacking is um, political willingness to act. And that's because um, politicians will only do something if they think voters care, they won't lose votes by it. And mm -hmm. so that's why it's so important that scientists should uh, explain the issues to a wide public yeah. and they should uh, be um, aimed by, aided by uh, charismatic individuals who could do a better job as influencers and scientists themselves can. I mean, it's very sad that Carl Sagan isn't still alive because he would be obviously uh, leading a campaign through his eloquence um, that would make people take uh, global warming and loss of diversity seriously. But I mean, I, I mentioned in my book four sort of charismatic figures, very different from each other, who have had quite a big effect. Uh, one is Pope Francis, through his encyclical in uh, 2015, which led to the standing ovation at the UN and a consensus at the 2015 Climate Conference. Second, David Attenborough, mm -hmm. uh, who's made people aware of biodiversity and uh, the problem of plastic in the ocean and climate change. Third is Bill Gates, who talks in a great deal of sense in his books about how we can uh, deal with, with climate change. And for, fourth, uh, Greta Thornburg, who uh, uh, has been the spokesperson for the younger generation, uh, who are still going to be alive at the end of a century and naturally care more about this. So people like that have, I think, raised public interest and awareness. And that's meant that voters will support this action. Um, and... Uh, uh, we need well more people like that, and it changed the rhetoric of business even, uh, yeah. although business has not responded enough. So I'm hopeful that the awareness of this general but long-term threat will deepen and widen, and that then the politicians will start to take action. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and in the closing moments that we have, I can't resist but be a little bit selfish and and pivot back to where, as I said, I met you way back when, uh, which was CMB polarization in the 19, late 1960s, just about three years after the discovery of the uh, background glow, the cosmic microwave background that pays the bills around the Keating house. Um, you were very prescient. You predicted the uh, possibility of a polarization signal. Can you explain what led you to that? Uh, again, this is a very nascent field. It would be like, you know, mm -hmm. somebody really going all in on, uh, you know, dark energy, uh, you know, research uh, in the early 2000s, say, when it was just becoming clear that serendipity struck then and, and it struck back in the 60s. What gave you the confidence to go into the impossible, as this podcast is titled, um, to to pursue that field as a, as a young scientist starting out? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, at at this time, uh, everyone's worried about why the universe was homogeneous. It was before the idea of inflation, which uh, uh, may be the answer to that, uh, but this didn't happen. And there was a popular idea due particularly to a guy called uh, Misner, which is that um, the, the universe went through a so-called mixed master phase, went expanded fast in one direction and then fast in another. And he was able to show that causal contact in that universe was better. And so you could understand why the universe homogenized early on, and uh, which is was a big mystery in uh, otherwise. And so um, this was the idea of universe which was homogeneous, but anisotropic. It expanded fast in one direction, then another. And then I, I realized that in those models, uh, we would expect polarization um, because the polarization would depend on where the expansion was fastest and slowest at the time of recombination. Uh, so I was fo focusing on that. But then I did mention at the end uh, that uh, uh, polarization would be a natural outcome of, of any case when you had the um, the gas moving around relative to the radiation. Um, so, so that it was, I think, the first paper written on CMB polarization. Yes, absolutely. And in the book, you talk or in the in the book, you do talk about obligations. You know, one of my favorite uh, passages, you're, you're really kind of debating or discussing um, the, the roles and basically the trade offs between human ingenuity, i.e. technology and uh, and basically whatever the opposite is, uh, uh, which is which is adaptation. 
And, you know, I, I wonder if you could look into your crystal, I have a crystal ball somewhere around here, but, but if you could look into the crystal ball and, and, and think about the transformations that could attack both COVID-19 and global warming uh, from the perspective of an astronomer, you ask a question, you know, what, what does an astronomer have to opine on this? And then you answer in the affirmative, they have a lot to say. I wonder, let's, let's talk about first uh, COVID-19. So you mentioned these vaccines and it is true they have properties of, you know, uh, that, that do inhibit the spread of disease and they're very positive, uh, beneficial, but they're, you know, in terms of efficacy and so forth against a, uh, uh, an adversary, if you will, that has 7 billion, 900 million Petri dishes <laughs> at any moment to be experimenting on, um, you know, what, what hope can physics or maybe astronomy, you know, is too, too narrow, but can physics address there? I mean, CRISPR play, played a role in it. You talk about CRISPR in the book talk about mm -hmm. Jennifer Doudna, et cetera. But, yeah. um, but you don't really maybe get into the molecular biology of it. Are there, is there a hope to save us from physics necessarily, or is it sort of out of the realm of, of where, you know, you or I as astronomers might be properly situated in our own lanes? Um, can physics maybe help us save us from future pandemics? If you had a bet now, based on what we've experienced recently. Well, I don't, because one point I often emphasize is that uh, physics is the easy subject, biology is a hard subject. That's right. You talk about the ease of detecting black holes. The structures of even a, even a virus or a small organism are far greater than anything in the cosmos. Uh, so it's a biological subject, so I am hesitate to comment. Yeah. But I think, you know, I, I do worry because it's true we... Uh, we can hope that vaccine technology will improve, but on the other hand, um, uh, in a more crowded world, uh, new variants are going to appear all the time. And uh, my greatest nightmare is, of course, engineered viruses, um, which can be used by uh, uh, bad actors, as it were, uh, to create pandemics. So I, I do worry very much about whether the world can be freed from, uh, in fact, ever more serious pandemics. So that's a big worry. Uh, in the quite separate issue of climate change, uh, then, of course, um, uh, this this uh, involves physics. Um, the uh, modeling of climate change involves physics. I mean, for instance, quite interesting things like cloud formation, which depends on the extent to which droplets super cool before they crystallize and things like that. Um, that uh, probably Tim Palmer discussed this sort of thing, yes. which affects how cloud cover changes in a warming world. Um, so we can hope for better physics and larger computers, which can uh, allow us to do better predictions of, uh, of climate on a regional basis. Um, but of course, what we want to do is to have ways of producing energy and storing energy without using fossil fuels. And here again, um, scientific advances mainly from physics are going to be crucial. You know, better battery technologies, um, et cetera, and more efficient solar panels, all these things, um, they're, they're going to be needed. So I think uh, climate change is a problem for physicists. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, I include engineers, because uh, the other point I make in the book is that the uh, amount of brain power needed in the application of science is greater than that needed in doing pure science. So uh, we need some clever new ideas, um, but then we hope they have to be uh, applied by engineers to be uh, cost effective. And the key thing is to... Uh, enable us to provide um, uh, clean energy and therefore net zero, um, not just for ourselves in the northern rich countries, but to enable the global south to do the same. Because mm -hmm. they, if they uh, can't use clean energy, can't afford it, then they will be 4 billion people. And as they develop, they will use a lot of fossil fuels, and they will produce about 40% as much CO2 per year as we now do, to be far from net zero. So it's very important to ensure that the global south can leapfrog directly to clean energy, just as they've leapfrogged directly to uh, smartphones and never had landlines. Yeah, and, and I wonder... Uh, mm -hmm. so, so we in the north have to uh, have a fast development program, not just for our own sake, but uh, in order to collaborate with them. Yeah, Tim suggests a CERN analog, analog for climate yeah. change application, supercomputing. We're not we're not nearly using the full spectrum of of supercomputing resources. But I was even thinking, 
as an astrophysicist, relativistic astrophysicist who's worked on so many fundamental topics, as we mentioned, uh, CMB, uh, polarization, uh, and isotropy, also um, uh, black holes, compact objects. Uh, I wonder if not, you know, an astronomer, who else? Because we are the kind of purveyors of, of fusion and really figured out fusion quite long ago. And I wonder uh, to what extent could we have a uh, great deal of hope to be saved, not from just, you know, solar powered, you know, windmills, but from from fusion, uh, from actual low cost. You know, if in other words, if God or, you know, Mother Earth or somebody tells you, Hensley Martin, here's a here's a working, you know, net positive, And you talk about ITAR and other things here. And um, and the the triple the triple uh, parameter. But um, what if you were handed here's a design here's this uh, for fusion? Where would that and it's and it would be effective and net net positive? What would be its role? And maybe to some extent fission's role in the portfolio to tackle um, to tackle uh, these global warming challenges? Because you know to push back again with respect, you know Greta Thunberg. You know, she's a vocal opponent of the cleanest, most reliable, you know, alternative green energy. And she's a dramatic opponent of fission reactors. And I find that ultimately inconceivable that she would be against the only source that we know because of, you know, the the nuclear waste problem and, and maybe some terrorist concerns and stuff, which are legitimate, but not to the level of if we really think the world is coming to an end, metaphorically speaking, for humans in our current state, the world's going to be fine, right, Martin? The the planet's going to go on without us. It'll be it'll be here. But for our children, our children's children, what would be the role of fission and fusion in the portfolio if you were Lord of Earth, Martin Rees, not just uh, of of the British Empire? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think, as you know, um, the whether we need nuclear, this is something which is controversial. Yes at all levels of expertise some lay people have strong views but even experts have strong views and uh, um, a great return of work could probably find half of the experts in the world who would say that we can get by um, with uh, effective storage not just for overnight but for six months um, and if that can be done um, then uh, with um, solar energy um, etc maybe solar energy from space as well as on the ground, uh, maybe that could be done. So it's not clear that uh, nuclear energy is is, is needed. Um, on the other hand, uh, other people say we should at least uh, do R and D into fourth generation nuclear fission. Um, I, I tend to be on the latter side, but I think um, it's, uh, it's it's not obvious that that's ever going to work. So I think you've got to be a bit fair at the Greater Toronto. Lots of people would share the view that we can get to net zero without nuclear. Um, that's one thing, but what, what about uh, uh, fusion? Yes. Um, there again, um, well, everyone knows that's that's more distant, um, and uh, uh, it's probably feasible. You, you know the problems you've got to um, uh, stabilize the magnetic field for long enough, and all that. And I think this could be done, but whether it'll be economic, um, I don't know. But uh, uh, there again, I'm very much in favor of the uh, R and D into into fusion, and it's very good that the there are now about 20 separate groups around the world um, doing different designs. Um, and uh, ITER, as you mentioned, uh, in retrospect, that's for, that's too big um, because they didn't think they could get a, a magnetic fields stronger than one Tesla, I think, when they when they built it. And if you can have stronger fields, then you can get by with smaller scale. And that's been done by by the uh, later developments. So uh, I, th I think th that's true. Uh, of course, there's a quite different um, kind of uh, uh, fusion using um, lasers focusing on little pellets. Yes. Um, I must say, I I've, uh, I've tended to be skeptical about that. It seems very hard to scale up. And uh, I'm afraid I've regarded that as a sort of fig leaf to justify the nuclear research they're doing at Livermore. <laughs> yeah, the Nova uh, laser. Um, so I, I won't speak negatively about a fellow University of California. Pro no, I'm just kidding. I would if I knew more about it. But they, they recently did report net positive or exothermic. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Although that's controversial. Some experts like past guests on the show, Charles Seif at NYU, suggest that's kind of moving the goalposts, you know, painting the target around the arrow. Yeah. Yeah, um, so Lord Martin, I want to finish up uh, by asking a few uh, questions for my audience, and then I'm going to conclude with my patented Fantastic Four 
frilling for final questions that I ask all my guests when they uh, honor me, as you have, by coming on the show, uh, this being your second appearance on the show. So the first question uh, comes from a, a listener uh, on YouTube. And by the way, you can um, ask me questions at uh, Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube and Dr. Brian Keating on Twitter. And you can ask Dr. Uh, Martin Reese, Lord Martin Reese at Lord Martin Reese on Twitter. Uh, he may or may not respond uh, with emoji cons the way that I will. But the first uh, question comes from a, a listener uh, named Huxley underscore S uh, who opines he or She says, I think trust in science is at an all time low, Lord Martin. Is it possible to reverse this and how? Um, well, I'd question that statement. I would have thought that uh, uh, the response to the pandemic uh, certainly increased the prestige of science. It's not high enough, uh, but I think uh, uh, the fact that the vaccines were produced within a year by groups, that was certainly an amazing scientific achievement. And I think um, uh, uh, if you certainly compare the trust in science with the trust in uh, politicians, journalists, uh, bankers and others, um, athletes and, yeah <laughs> uh, so i i, I don't uh, share the pessimism we've got to improve and we've got to interact with the uh, the public better um but uh, i think um uh, science um uh, although some people are concerned about its scary downsides uh, does have a positive image so great thank you um next uh king posse asks uh but where the danger is also grows the saving power. And that's a quote from Friedrich Holdelin Patmos. And the question that King Posse one asks is, does Sir Martin believe there's such thing as a saving power? Maybe a supernatural one. And if yes, Lord Martin, what form does it take? Or can it be physically observed? What yes. say you? Um, well, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't believe... Um, in any sort of uh, uh, saving power of that kind. I, I think uh, uh, we humans have to avoid destroying ourselves and apply our growing knowledge uh, to human benefit. And it's clear that this is possible. We can, even with present knowledge, make a world for the entire population, uh, which is as good as the world we enjoy in countries like the United States and the UK. Uh, so we can do this. Um, and I think we, we have. I mean, um, uh, I don't think we're going to get any uh, help from outside um, our own human efforts. Mm -hmm. Very good. So the next one is uh, coming from a, a listener viewer on YouTube um, who goes by a name that I almost chose for one of my children, and that is Zero Skull. Uh, Zero Skull asks um, a very long question. So pro tip for my listeners out there, if you want to, uh, have a high shot at asking your question, me asking it, make it short <laughs> uh, because I, I can't read this whole thing. But he says, what exactly is meant by save us and save the world? Save us in what way? Save us from who? Save us for what reasoned purpose? Why not just ride it to the end and counter to frost, go gently into the good night? So what are we saved from by science? Or well, I think most of us do care about the uh, survival of the human species. And uh, my concern is that for the first time in this century, there are realistic scenarios whereby the misuse of science could lead to a collapse of civilization. And we certainly have a bumpy ride through the century because of the misuse of science by bad actors. So I think we are uh, going through um, a difficult century. And um, uh, uh, being a human being myself, uh, I certainly feel that our species um, deserves to uh, survive and to do better in future centuries. But more than that, <clears throat> I think we should um, value the, um, <clears throat> the entire biological um, uh, environment that we are in and avoid mass extinctions and we are risking those. And if I quote in my book, the great ecologist E.O. Wilson, who says, if human actions cause mass extinctions, it's the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. Right. So we want to make sure that there are future generations and that they uh, are forgiving because we have helped not ourselves to survive only, but also the natural world to survive. Very, very good. 
Well, uh, Lord Martin, this has been a tremendous honor as usual for me. I now want to conclude with what I call the Fantastic Four. But seeing as you've been on before when it was the Thrilling Three, I'm just going to ask you the new aspects of this question that are pertinent to this new book. And uh, and they are as follows. So <clears throat> you quote in this book, uh, a quote from the namesake of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. You say, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's one of his famous quotes. And it's um, led me to kind of ask people if you could pit one discovery, not necessarily by you, although it's it's totally acceptable mm -hmm. if you made the discovery. Um, you know, Richard Feynman said that the most important uh, question of all or, or knowledge of all is the so-called atomic hypothesis. What sort of wisdom or knowledge or teaching or discovery by human beings would you be comfortable as representing the most amount of knowledge and therefore advanced technology, perhaps uh, most magical invention of human beings? Well, I think the biggest challenge is to understand the brain and life itself. And uh, uh, this can be be done in a number of ways. And also an astronomer, I would hope that uh, if we can discover evidence for life in other places, which is certainly possible, and see what variety it displays, that will help us to understand our place, not just on the Earth, uh, but in the wider cosmos. So I'm hopeful of understanding uh, life and uh, intelligence um, and brains. Very good. And then the newest of the fantastic four questions that I've added is another quote from Sir Arthur. Did you know him, by the way, Lord Martin? Um, I exchanged emails with him uh, okay. about whether the M87 jet was artificial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan, obviously, of his works, but uh, yeah. I, I didn't ever meet him. Right. Well, he said uh, fame. He said a lot of things, including... Um, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. He was quite pithy. Uh, but one of my favorite quotes of his is uh, when, a, <laughs> when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, they are almost certainly right. When mm -hmm. they state something is impossible, they are very probably wrong. Yes. I want to ask you, Lord Martin, on the off chance that you were ever wrong about something, uh, besides the exact mechanism for CMB polarization, we're not going to hold that against you. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> but have you changed your mind recently or in a, in a significant way throughout your career or recently on anything related to science? Um, I haven't really, but I think uh, what was a change is that many of the challenges which uh, uh, we were speculating about when I started have been settled mm -hmm. and we're now addressing questions that couldn't even be posed. 50 years ago. So that's an indication of the exciting progress that uh, astronomy and cosmology has made in the last 50 years, uh, due, as I emphasize in my book, uh, not to armchair theorists like me, but mainly to much more sophisticated engineering and far better instruments on the ground and in space. Uh, yeah. But I think uh, there's been a huge advance. And so the, um, the problems that uh, I'm thinking about now couldn't have been posed 50 years ago. Um, but I think uh, there's a lot of tr truth because um, uh, it's rare for scientists to do their best work in old age, whereas it's quite common for musicians to produce their best compositions in old age. And as I say in my book, um, this is because if you're a composer, then you're influenced by the stars when you were young, but then it's internal development, where science is an inherently collective activity. And so to keep it the frontier, you've got to... Uh, absorb new ideas, understand new techniques, etc. And that's something we become less good at as we get older. So yeah. we've got to stick to things we can understand and accept our limitations. Very good. And, well, uh, well, yeah. Oh, sorry, I missed the last part you said. Okay, so yeah. carry on, I guess. Yeah, so, so keep calm and carry on as a, a, always a, a very good British aphorism. Uh, Lord Martin, I want to thank you as usual for your uh your your very wonderful contributions to my life my career but also to the greater scientific good this wonderful book uh if science is to save us please everybody get this book and read this book engage with it because it's it's written this year i mean there's it's, it's not some stale book that was written before that it's fresh uh and relevant and pertinent and will have the ability maybe i'll ask you one more question lord martin um yep. it said that uh some authors would rather have 
um, you know, kind of one book read a hundred years from now, then sell a hundred books, you know, one year from now, <laughs> which do you prefer? Do you prefer your books have longevity or massive critical and six and popular success? Um, well, I think many of the questions I'm addressing are fairly timely. Yeah. And so we'll be out of date. So, yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, for instance, my, my, my book called On the Future four yes. years ago was, as you say, it talks about pandemics in the abstract. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, in the paperback, which came out just last year, I had an extra chapter of lessons learned from COVID. So I, I think um, some of the things that I discuss about how science is done may still be true 100 years from now. I don't know, but most of it will be out of date. So yeah. uh, I expect that... Um, um, I have hope there are some sales in the next year or two, but I expect they will decline. Although um, my book, Just Six Numbers, yeah. has been the most steady seller for 25 years. And I was lucky because I wrote it just after the last big number was discovered. Right. And I would my choice of six uh, now, 25 years later. <laughs> right. Uh, that's uh, it also, you know, in some ways led to uh, the uh, also great and deserve recognition, the Templeton Prize and, and many other accolades that are too numerous. It would take us another two hours to read it. But Martin, I want to thank you so much for sharing so much of your time with me and my audience today. And I hope we can be in person. Maybe I'll come visit you next year when I visit the UK for the first time in three or four years. Yeah, it's not that bad here. <laughs> Maybe I can poach you, Martin. I mean, come on, we've got great beaches. I know you like to surf, uh, and uh, you, we've 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 fetted you in the past, and we'll do it again. Um, Lord Martin Reese, uh, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.